Namo Buddhaya. Good evening. Welcome to the Buddha Dharma TV. I am Karen Tan. Today, we begin our program as usual with the blessing service conducted by Venerable Buddhist monks. To achieve the desired calmness, please listen to the chanting mindfully. Namo Tansa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sangbundhansa Namo Tansa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sangbundhansa Namo Thassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sangbundhansa Iti Piso Bhagava Arahan Samma Sangbundo Vinjacharana Sampanno Sugato Loka Vidu Anuntaro Puris Dhamma Sarati Santa Deva Manunsanam Buddha Bhagavati Swangato Bhagavata Dhammo Sangdindhiko Akaliko Ehi Pansiko Opanaiko Panchantang Veditam Vinyu iti Supati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sango Ujupati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sango Nyaya Pati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sango Samiji Patipanno Bhagavato Savaka Sango Yadidam Chantari Purisa Yugani Ante Purisa Pungala Esa Bhagavato Savak Sango Ahuniyo Pahuniyo Dankiniyo Anjali Karaniyo Anuntarang Punyang Kintang Lokasansati let us focus our attention on Venerable Ajahn Achalo as he presents the insightful discussion. Prepare yourselves for a deep dive into his wisdom and guidance. His words promise to enrich our understanding and inspire us to reflect on our actions. Please welcome Ajahn Achalo of Australia to conduct the discussion. Generally, I believe that if a teacher does his job properly, explains what the hindrances are, what the powers are, what the meditation objects are, how to cultivate metta and buddha nusati, lift confidence, brighten the mind, there won't be many questions. <laughs> Twenty-one questions. Dear Ajahn, Every time I sit down to meditate, I have a lot of wandering thoughts. What should I do? 
So, a few a few questions ask the same question essentially. So, if in daily life, for a long time, we have let let our thoughts wander, it's not it's not really going to be possible to come to a meditation retreat and they slow down quickly. What what you have is the momentum of your habits, and so. It's still valuable. It's still valuable because you're you're getting to see what an untrained mind is like, and uh, you might not notice other, otherwise. But well, they call it the monkey mind, right? It it does jump around a lot. So. It takes a lot of uh, patient endurance, and we have to a lot of effort. And also, it's a bit of a carrot and stick. You you have to uh, remind yourself of what the benefits are. That you, at the very least, develop more awareness of what is a wholesome thought, a skillful thought, an unwholesome thought. Developing a sense of perspective, context, and. Uh, but also, we have to think of the consequences of not training the mind. So, if we don't train the mind, where will this constant thinking lead it? If we have no control of it, so in some in many respects, we don't really have much choice. We just have to we have to work with it the way it is, and we have. But in seeing the consequence of having allowed a mind to wander a lot. And uh, then I think it's good, in a retreat situation, to make some aspirations or have a sense of how you might change your lifestyle when you go back, so that it's less, uh, more conducive to, more disciplined, more focused, more structured, perhaps. And I think the portable devices made everyone's life much easier. And much harder because you can do so much, right? You can talk to the people you want to in the moment. You can get information you want in the moment, but it really feeds restlessness and it really feeds impatience. That kind of expectation of instant results. And uh, I think you know, in the good old days, a decade or two ago, I think there were just many more ordinary, spacious moments. Where we weren't doing stuff, we might just notice the sky, or notice a cloud, or notice a flower, notice the person next to you, talk to them. You look these days at airports and bus stops, and everyone's looking at their screen. And so I think making some some uh, sensible boundaries with these devices is help. It will be helpful as well. In, in terms of having a less crazy mind, a less busy mind, I recommend, of course, that people begin meditating first thing in the morning, back in your lay life, before looking at your device, like before checking messages, before checking news, before looking at social media. You know, set set the alarm. You can leave it on flight mode all night if you like, so that there's no pinging and uh, be less radiation zapping your brain as well. Next to your bed. After your meditation, turn it on. Have a look. Let uh, open up consciousness to all that other stuff. And uh, I think that's just sensible. You'll have. I, I recommend stopping using it at about nine or ten. I don't know what time you sleep, but mostly Southeast Asians sleep quite late. And uh, you know, give yourself an hour or two before sleeping when you don't look at it at all. And uh, then have a proper sleep. Get up a bit earlier, meditate, and and then deal with it. <laughs> so the contemplation of death can be helpful, but the contemplation of death also requires a capacity to think in a directed, focused way. But in, in general, uh, simplifying your life a bit, 
committing to a daily meditation practice. It gets better with time. And, uh, but it does take time. Some of our habits are like... It's like a train, I suppose, is a good analogy. A train that's running full speed doesn't stop quickly. It takes some time. It been, it been, it, you know, in the old days it was coal, right? It was a coal engine and steam. There's all that coal, there's all that heat, there's all that steam. It took a while to build up. And it will, it will slow down and cool down if we stop feeding the coal and if we stop blowing the wind into the engine. So our minds are a bit like that. So please persevere. Dear Arjan, in the Sutta it is mentioned that we enter the stream by listening to Dhamma, not by meditating. It doesn't say that. What is it? If so, why do we have to meditate so hard? Is it true that we can reach Sotapanna only by listening to the Dhamma? Yes, after millions of hours of meditation. <laughs> so we need to understand that these heroic Olympic grade ascetics were, you know, gold medal meditators in their day. So those are the people who are listening. And the people who have mastery of the jhanas, uh, we're very familiar with these, the, bo the body parts, the khandas, the Buddha was describing rupa, vedana, consciousness, all these things. And uh, so when Lord Buddha is instructing those, they are able to bring a meditative awareness and meditative focus to what he's describing, and then, then they can get such results. So uh, some people do attain while listening but it's normally while listening to a Buddha and uh, when we have examples of this you understand what do you think it would be like if a Buddha was spreading metta to you do you think your mind might become peaceful <laughs> I think it would be pretty nice so th th that's another factor the Buddha's capacity to suppress your hindrances with his pure samadhi and metta. Imagine you're sitting three or four meters from the Buddha. He's smiling at you, he's explaining something to you, he's spreading metta, he's, everything's very cool. Yes. So, yes, if you're listening to the Buddha, you can probably become enlightened. I hope you have the opportunity. <laughs> so, But, you know, there is... Investigation, contemplation does play a role. But it's uh, the three types of developing wisdom, listening, reading, and uh, then contemplating what has been taught. Does that make sense? Does it make sense? And then the practice of it. For example, a monk says, contemplating the body. A problem that we have is that you feel like you're a self. This feeling like you're a self causes grasping, causes reactivity, liking and not liking a sense of a past and a future, a self in a world. This causes all sorts of trouble. If you are to contemplate the body as parts, then contemplate further and see those parts as elements, then separate one element and look just at that element, the sense of self may fall away, and you may glimpse Nibbana, or the unconditioned. Okay, it makes sense. Go and contemplate it. Yes, the sense of self does is fraught with challenges and difficulties. Maybe I'll try. And so you familiarize yourself with the meditation object and you develop some skill and then as you continue, you develop insight. So thought and contemplation plays a role. The user, this is the Samma Sankapo, right thought. Tirajan, what should I do if I want to enter the stream in this very life? The fastest way, please. That could have been about 50 of you asking that question. Ajahn Anand, very skillful, my teacher. He always says it's possible. Possible and probable. Different words, aren't they? 
ได้ได้ได้ไดโอ้ได้ได้ได้ไดอืมดีดีดี You can, you can, you can. Good, good, good. He used to, <laughs> he used to tell people uh, if they had the requisite quality to actually do it, like ready, in the, in the good old days. And he, but he noticed that that had a bad effect on them, and that sometimes those people would get more arrogant and more conceited and practice less. I've got enough barami to be a stream enterer, so he stopped doing that. And now he says everyone can do. So everyone could. It's possible if everyone was extremely diligent. <laughs> How diligent are we going to be? That's the question. So, Lord Buddha describes his own dharma vinaya, teaching and training, teaching and discipline as a gradual training. It is a lifetime's process. And so, I think it is good to set the aspiration. If you're clear that you want liberation, it's good to set the aspiration that I would like liberation as quickly as possible. One has, one has that aspiration, and then you drop the time frame. I think that's the only way, because the sense of self with an agenda will obstruct wanting desires. Obstructs the results, so we have to be clear of our aspiration, and then we have to sow the causes, and then we have to be patient with when the results come, because it's it's not actually up to us, it's not up to the self view to decide when the mind is liberated from the self view. It's a matter of when the mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom are powerful enough. So, but in general, good instruction: be generous, keep your precepts, meditate if possible every morning, every afternoon, every evening, every day, and uh, then you're going to increase your chances a lot. It's definitely coming closer. We still don't know. We don't know if it will be within this lifetime, but it's coming closer. The kind of karma that you're making with the practice. And the the effort that you're making to ripen your faculties, it, it's definitely coming closer. l o m p o I've mentioned before, l o m p o Bieg says it's if you're late at night and you're tired and you think there's no point in sitting, he says it's actually better to sit because you're even if your head's drooped over and you're dribbling, he said it's because you're laying that habit is something that you will do. And uh, you probably find that sometimes the mind's really bright and clear. Simply because you've you've establishing this habit, so some practice every morning, every afternoon, every evening. Why? Because you don't want to you don't want a really big chunk of time to go by without lowering the level of ignorance in the mind. So ignorance, we in meditation we contemplate in various ways. We're kind of lowering the level of ignorance, lowering the sense of self, contemplating wisely, brightening the mind. But then what happens is the ignorance and the sense of self it comes flooding back in. So it's this: uh, wash it out, it comes in again. Wash it out, it comes in again. So if you wash more frequently, it's going to get less. But if you wash once and it gets completely dirty again, it's a wash once. It's like one step forward, one step back. But if you're doing, and so it doesn't have to be sitting meditation. It can be walking meditation. It can be chanting. It can be listening to a dhamma talk. But we find ways to integrate some practice of Buddha Dhamma. In our life, several times a day, for busy working people, it might not be possible yet. But we aim for some in the morning, some in the afternoon. With the traffic situation in uh, Kuala Lumpur, I was uh, giving a talk at Nalanda the other day, and many people have to spend an hour in the car in the morning, or in the car at night. And I was saying, that's your chanting time. You know, if if you, if you. Feel frustrated. It's a waste of time. Spend your time feeling a bit irritated, a bit impatient. Checking your phone, listening to some news, entertaining yourself, distracting yourself. That is a waste of time. But if you know that it takes 45 minutes to do 180 to be s o s and you know your drive is 45 minutes, don't even have to count, right? You just to be so b a k a w a r a n g s a m a s a m b u t o and and 
like I said, sometimes it, you're not into it at first, but after five minutes you probably will be. People might look at you a bit strange, that's okay. They're strange too. It's actually not strange, is it, to, to actually consciously brighten your mind. It's strange to sit in a car and be irritated. And you can, you know, whatever your favorite man, mantra. If you don't, if it feels strange doing it yourself, turn on whoever your favorite. I mean, I think Arjuna Nan has a, I think there is a audio of it. You can do it along with your friends. Put the stereo on, chant along. And, uh, you know, there's various things you can do to make it not weary. You can make it a chant that you actually like. And you can change it a bit. Okay, this day it's morning chanting, tonight, tonight it's evening chanting. Tomorrow it's 180 to be so, and next day it's the Paritas. You, know, you can have a bit of a, a alternating. And if a, if a person was sincere with that, like if I had to be living in Kuala Lumpur and I had to do that, I would do that. If I had to be in the car for an hour, going somewhere an hour, coming back, I would chant in the car. So, one suggestion. Some people say Jesus is the future Maitreya. What's your opinion? I don't know. And I don't dare say. But he does have a lot of disciples. I think there are many, there are many future Buddhas, huh? and the path is very long. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if he is a future Buddha. But we don't know, we don't know if he's received his prediction of Buddhahood yet. So since we have the teachings of an actual Buddha with us, we're going to focus on those. Satu. Dear Ajahn, how does insight arise? Do we need to bring in contemplation on a nitya when the mind is calm in our meditation? So, yes. So, at first, we're trying to make, we're making the effort to make the mind calm. And uh, for a lot of people that's a bit challenging. Once there is calm, um, more consistently some calm, some, some stability, it is a good way to develop insight, is to notice changing and particularly the cessation of feelings. So I met Lumpur Panyawado, senior Western disciple of Ajahn Mahabua. I met him when I was a novice. 29 years ago, and he explained that he had got quite good results by watching feelings change in the heart and chest area. So when the mind becomes a little more sensitive, you will notice that every hindrance, all of the, even the thoughts that manifest in your brain, they actually bubble out of this area. I mean, some people call it the seat of the mind. And there's feelings there. So every hindrance has feelings associated with it. When it's coarse, you'll probably notice, suppose you're very angry, trying to meditate, but you're angry. You'll notice this heat, you'll notice this con contraction. And uh, if there's a sensual fantasy, you'll notice that there's kind of a dizzying, you know, there are feelings there. Sloth. There's dullness, fuzziness, heaviness. So when the, when the mind has enough stability to be, one can observe the breath in this area, but also notice the various feelings in that area as they change and as they cease, because you're observing the breath anyway. You, it was in the center of your awareness is focused there. And uh, you can see these feelings move around this area and then sometimes they, they're gone and a different kind of feeling arises. And So he was believed to be an anagami, that's a non-returner and he said that he'd got good results from doing that practice. So I, I took his advice seriously and I applied myself, I also got some nice results. So focusing on the, seeing the feeling and seeing Permanence, impermanence, impermanence, impermanence. The sense of self or the grasping at the body and feelings as being a self 
is based upon an assumption that things are permanent. And we don't really know that until we investigate it. But what happens is when we train ourselves to notice change and cessation, change and cessation, change and cessation, we're not feeding that assumption of permanence. We're not feeding the ignorance. And uh, that feeling of being a self can evaporate for periods of time. And this is a very important experience to have and to glimpse because if a, if a practitioner is sitting and there is a body and there's sounds and there's no, and there's awareness, but there's no feeling of a self there for a period of time. And then the feeling of self comes back and starts having a story. Oh, that was a really cool experience. Oh, that was, I'm going to go and tell all my friends about it. But the calm, clear awareness that saw the body, experienced the body without a sense of self, then understands, oh, it's true. It is a habitual way of perceiving it, but it's not the reality. Because if I don't feed it by constantly feeding ignorance, if I actually feed mindfulness, that sense of being a self can disappear for periods of time. Oh, that's very interesting. And, and if a person has that experience, what they a vipassana jnana, insight knowledge, it's, it's knowledge that goes in on a deeper level, you don't forget it. And it becomes banya barami, banya spiritual power. It's a, and it's a chink in the armor. It's like, you, you begin, oh, what the Lord Buddha said was true. And uh, I've had an interesting experience when I was a novice practicing and doing a retreat with Ajahn Sumedho. And I was doing this practice. And uh, it was really interesting, this feeling of self from the stomach down wasn't there. So there was this feeling of the top part, a habitual, habitual feeling of Samanera Achalo, sitting there meditating. And below was just legs, not I, not mine. And uh, that feeling of being a self, that grasping, moved up through the abdomen, through the chest, through the arms, and then got kind of was there. So from the neck down was just a body, awareness, peacefulness, no feeling of being a self, and the sense of self was just was here. I continued to be aware of feelings, ceasing, ceasing, ceasing. And that feeling of being a self disappeared through the top of my head. And then, and then it was just a body and awareness and no feeling of being a self. What you notice in such an experience is when there's no feeling of being a self, there's no suffering. Because it's the self that suffers by liking and not liking. And of course, the feeling of being a self came back not long afterwards. Uh, oh, Lumpur Samedo, I just had a really good experience. Oh, very good, Samedo Chalo. But to this day, I don't forget it. It's my first real glimpse of, oh, if you don't feed the self-view, if you feed mindfulness and wisdom instead, you can experience the body and mind without it present. It's very encouraging. So in particular, notice change and cessation. Change and cessation. Change and cessation. You can do it with the breath as well. And uh, when we're doing the breath meditation, once the mind has some peacefulness, just pay attention to the very end part of the in-breath. And then notice that the space in between also has an end before the next, out, before the out-breath starts. And notice the cessation of the out-breath. We train ourselves to notice flux. Dear Ajahn kindly advise the way I don't manage to observe the breath in and out with Buddha for long. Obvious wandering thoughts interchange with unwholesome feelings in the heart instead. So it's the same thing. Sitting meditation was brighter before this period, so then we have to have a look. What have we been doing before this period? Have, have you been busier than normal? Have you been more distracted than normal? And uh, normally, if we come and we find that there's a lot of wandering thoughts and we're not able to be with the meditation object, normally that is the case. And uh, it's normal, like we shouldn't get contentious or disheartened 
we just have to notice we're students of Dhamma, we're studying truth. If I live a very restless, distracted life when I come to meditate, it's distraction. That's the way it is. If if becoming peaceful and wise is something that's important to me, then I need to change my mode of being outside of retreat. Then the next re- next retreat will be easier. But one of the reasons I recommend meditating in the morning, going to bed a bit earlier and meditating in the morning, is because the mind will have rested. Most people's minds don't start busy first thing in the morning. So if you really stop looking at your device, you really get to sleep at a proper hour, you really get up, you do some chanting and some meditation, probably you won't have many thoughts. Other than I want to go back to bed, but we don't do that. Please persevere. And uh, I think many people have the experience that it's not until day three in meditation retreats that the mind uh, settles. So that's quite common. We're only in day two. So keep going. Dear Rajan, on Sunday evening, public Dhamma sharing, you said that Yasa's story gives you hope. <laughs> Can you please elaborate why? So those those five ascetics, they're like they're superheroes, aren't they? They Olympic Olympic grade austerity practitioners. Well, I'm not an Olympic grade austerity practitioner. I'm sorry to confess. And uh, people have their although although you know, I went to the jungle on the border of Burma and, and lived on a bamboo bed for two or three months, seven times. I need to stick up for myself a bit. <laughs> seven times. I spent a year and a half of my life in the jungle. Me and the tigers. Actually, I never saw one. I just saw tiger poo and footprints. So disappointing. It'd be really cool to have a tiger story. I saw tiger poo. But there, there were times, there were times where you get this shiver up your back meditating at night, right? And even the insects go quiet. That's how scary tigers are. Even the insects go shoo <laughs> <laughs> So you could kind of, you could feel when they were around. And, uh, but obviously since a lot of humans in the jungle have guns, I think tigers have changed their behavior. When you read those stories and the tigers come and visit the monks and walk around the monks and growl, I think since tigers get shot at, tigers stay in the shadows more. So I never saw a tiger. But I did go to the jungle seven times, don't forget. <laughs> and uh, leeches, ew. And uh, yeah, going going to practice in the jungle is wonderful because you do do a lot of death meditation. There's very big trees, and if a storm comes in, you know, a branch could literally fall on your head. Trees are falling down around you, and and uh, it's good practice. But in general, I my character tends to be a little bit epicurean. Do you know what that means? I don't know what it is, like I just know quality when I see it without even trying. Like sometimes I'm an abbot, I have to be involved in building projects, like I would force myself to go to the cheaper hardware, right? And I'm looking at tiles from like 20 meters away and I'm like, that one's nice. And I'll go over there and it's the one quality expensive item in the whole tile section. (laughs) So frustrating. And I just know, there's things I just know. I just know if it's fake sandalwood oil or real sandalwood oil. I just know. (laughs) But it's better than wine tasting, you know. (laughs) So different people have had different trajectories in samsara. So there may have been some princely past lives. And we have to work with what we have. And... uh, so Yasa is a good example of someone who was living a very comfortable life and when he received, you know, which is obviously the result of dana, you don't get to live surrounded by fine things and 
beauty without having been very generous. So, but when he received the correct teaching in no, no long time, he became a Sri Mantra. That's why he gives me hope. It's a very beautiful story because uh, he's, he was very loved by his parents and uh, his wife. So when the, when the king came, when, the, when his father came, he wasn't a king, but he was a rich merchant, and the Buddha used his psychic powers. He knew that Yasa couldn't go back. It would be difficult to go back to the lay life, having seen Nibbana and developed faith in the Buddha. So he, the Buddha used his psychic powers to make Yasa not visible to the, the father, and he taught the father instead. And while he taught the father, the father became a stream enterer, and Yasa became an arahant. And he knew now that as a stream enterer with unshakable faith in Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, the father won't make Yasa come home and run the family business. You Chinese fathers, you know, you know what I'm talking about. And, uh, but then the Buddha's compassion, there was two wives at home. So the Buddha accepted his first meal invitation and he taught Yasa's wife, and he taught Yasa's father's, Yasa's mother, and they became stream enterers too. So uh, it's very sweet, isn't it? That after, after teaching these austere Olympiads, he taught the, uh, the ladies at home, and they too became stream enterers. So these stories give us all hope, don't they? <laughs> Apparently, Yasa had, in part of his generosity practice in a previous life, he had helped to crem cremate poor people's, the relatives of poor people who couldn't afford the firewood and stuff. So he had actually developed that wisdom, uh, banya sanya, from seeing impermanence and seeing that it's not that beautiful. But because of his generosity, uh, goodness, metta, he's born in very fine circumstances but his mind was ripe to, to have insight because of his uh, wise practices. Dharajan, please guide on how to make aspirations to realize Nibbana. Yeah, so if a person can get clear, where it gets a little bit complicated is most of us, most of you, have had some lives in Theravadan tradition countries and some lives in Mahayana tradition countries and have probably practiced some of both. It's uh, because Buddhism was in India for a thousand years and in China for a thousand years. And people who have the uh, enough merit to come and do meditation retreats, for example, have many people have spent some time cultivating virtue in those places. And sometimes some lives you meet an inspiring Theravadan practitioner and you're like, oh, I want to be an arahant like him. And then another life you meet a great bodhisattva practitioner and you're like, oh, I want to be a bodhisattva like him. And then you come and you try to practice and you feel a bit torn. I don't know if I want to aspire to the fastest possible liberation or if I want to help beings. Or... So if you, can get, if you can get clear on that, that's helpful. So, to give a little thought, do you want to realize, realize Nibbana as quickly as possible? Okay. If you do, there is something that you should do, Tanajan Dun teaches. You, after your most peaceful meditation, whatever level you're at, whatever peaceful is for you, but after whatever is the most peaceful types of meditations for you, then you actually have to make the resolution to... Uh, cancel any previous vows for great discipleship, the Cheka Buddhahood or Buddhahood. So you, you actually have to wipe the slate clean and make it clear, my aspiration is to be a stream enterer as quickly as possible. And because sometimes it might be the case that you might just be a villager and you met an arahant who had some wonderful abilities the apinya, ability to read minds, ability to see devas, maybe see something about past lives. And you may have just thought, 
Wow, that's so cool. I want to be just like that. I want to be just like Lom Paul. And you might put food in his bowl for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. May I be just like Lom Paul. May I be liberated and have these abilities just like Lom Paul. May I be as wonderful as my Lom Paul. And you don't realize that to have the full psychic powers literally means hundreds more lives. They don't come just because of the wish. They come because of lots of practice. So if you've made those kind of wishes, and many people have, and now you want stream entry, now you want stream entry fast, so fickle, <laughs> then you actually have to uproot previous vows and make it clear. No, 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 I'm sick. I really am sick of suffering. I want to be liberated as quickly as possible. And then, and then you have to repeat that. So whenever you have a particularly peaceful sit, you just make the aspiration. But as I said, drop the, drop the timeline as quickly as possible, but you're not looking at the clock, right? Whenever, <laughs> it happens when it happens. But you know you want, you want out of here. So you make that aspiration like that. I want vision, immaculate vision of Nibbana. I want to experience the unconditioned and I want to be liberated as quickly as possible. Okay, if you're not sure, or if you are sure, if you want to be a Buddha, then you have to do similarly. After your peaceful meditations, you have to make that aspiration. You have to make it deep and you need to repeat it. If you make these aspirations in spiritual power centers, they'll be even more powerful. Bodh Gaya is a very good place to make your aspiration for the type of liberation that you want. The liberation is the same, but the qualities that you'll have when you are liberated is different. So it's good to make the aspiration there if you can. And if you're in between and you can't decide, then uh, Arjuna Nan says that's okay too. He says because what will happen is when the spiritual powers get to a certain point where the mind is going to start experiencing vipassana and jnanas, and then it has to go either way. At that point, the mind will make a choice, and you'll feel confident, the practitioner will feel confident of that choice. Suppose if you're, if you're a suitable candidate for being a Buddha, for example, when the mind gets to that point, it will be, no, I don't want to leave so quickly. I want to help a lot of beings on the way, and then it'll go in that bodhisattva path. Or it's like, oh, Nibbana, Nibbana, I can smell it, I can smell it, oh, let's go, okay. It'll go in that way. And if it's not there yet, you, you just practice until you get there, and the decision will make itself then, so. No excuses, have to practice a lot, whatever your choice. When a person realizes Nibbana, does it mean that a person has become an Arahant? So, this is a convention of speech, isn't it? So, the person, when, when we who are not Arahants want to, de want to describe a person's, another person's situation, we can say they became an Arahant. For that person, they didn't become anything. They stopped all becoming. That's why they're an Arahant. So, we need to understand conventional reality, ultimate reality, the Arahant has no more coming into any type of being, didn't become anything, stopped becoming. That's, that's how he became an Arahant. <laughs> so the Arahant does not conceive as the body and feelings as self, has established the mind in liberation, and then we call, we call them an Arahant. Why, when we practice metta, is it not encouraged to send metta to spouses or close partners, or people of the gender that we find attractive? Is it because more attachment will arise in the relationship? So, in general, by now, many of you will have experienced that the first hindrance, sensual craving, the mind can go into sexual fantasy. So, a lot of energy in karma, raga, kilesa, sexual passion. So, we don't want to we don't want to incline the mind to that so but if you want to have metta for your spouse suppose you've been married for 10 20 years anymore it's not that passionate anyway you can spread loving kindness to your to your partner <laughs> what do i know about these things 
Sorry. But yeah, so when, when, when we're working on that first category of beings, uh, people for whom it is easy to have loving kindness for, often we'll think about the people we love most. Well, you think of the one you love most. But uh, if, if, if there's sexual passion involved in that, it's, it's best to avoid it, because you don't want your metta meditation to become a sexual fantasy. But you can spread metta to your partner if you don't find them very sexy anymore. So too. <laughs> I think one thing that you can do, like obviously you want to you wanna make your relationship, like it's good. I think one thing what one can do for one's partner that is wholesome is to dedicate merit to them. I think that's that's one way we can do it where it's not going to become a fantasy. So it's like, obviously you want to have a good foundation of your relationship. You want good energy flowing between one another. So another thing is you can do is like, when your partner does something good, you rejoice. When you do something good, you ask them to rejoice. If you do something, you dedicate merit to them. All of that is helping that relationship to be to be wholesome and have a good foundation. So. Dear Bhante, in everyday life I see thoughts arising and ceasing, feelings arising and ceasing, intentions arising and ceasing, consciousness arising and ceasing, and also there's a duality when the awareness is present, the mental object is not, so there'll be a good quality of presence of mind, and vice versa. If the mental energy, mental object is very present, the mindfulness isn't very strong. Therefore, it seems that neither of them is present all the time. It doesn't seem to happen with physical objects. When I have a stomachache, for example, the pain persists even when awareness is turned towards it. So this is interesting. There's no such thing as a physical pain. You think your knee pain's in your knee, don't you? You think your back pain's in your back? Lord Buddha describes feelings in the body as feelings arise due, arising due to body-based contact. But it is body consciousness where feelings are arising. So the proof of this is when someone's dead and there's a corpse lying there and you go and you punch him in the face, the corpse doesn't yell, ouch! Because if the feeling was in the physical organism, it would. I've never punched a corpse in the, a corpse in the face, but I'm making a point. So why is it the case that and a, a, a more subtle feeling, so based on the mind sense space, okay? So then the mind sense space is what feels love, hatred, attraction, aversion. Body consciousness feels the in breath and the out breath. The pains in the knee and the pain in the body, but it's all in consciousness. But we can understand that it's a more coarse type of consciousness. So because it's a more coarse type of consciousness and, because, and there's certain karmas that are arriving, karmas that are associated with having a human body that uh, we have to deal with pain that appears to be in the body but is in body consciousness. And yes, sometimes it doesn't go away. I was recently practicing in Bogaya. I had awful pain behind my shoulder blade for 14 days. It just didn't go away. The left shoulder blade had some dreams and some intuitions that it was related to having sacrificed cows and buffaloes in past lives. There's that wrong view that offering blood to gods is merit. But uh, beings that we harm, whether our intention is good or not, it makes karma. So it took 14 days, and uh, after that, there wasn't shoulder pain. So yeah, karma ripens as a feeling in the body. Lumpur Nan says that uh, people who die really painful deaths of cancer, because some types of cancer are more painful than others, it's usually if they've harmed a lot of beings in past life, if you've been a hunter or a fisherman or 
that kind of thing. So it comes back. Hajan, it's the feeling of metta the same for everybody. Please describe your feeling of metta. Thank you. So I don't know if it's the same for everybody, but I suspect it's slightly different. And I, I sometimes say we all live in different universes. This is not the Buddha's teaching, this is Ajahn Chah's teaching. And the reason I say that is, uh, you know, you, you notice how differently people perceive the same thing sometimes when you're an abbot or a, a teacher. So, huh? I, I see it one way, other people see it a different way. And the way we perceive things is, I believe, affected by the previous 10, 100,000, 10,000 lives. So that's affecting the way you perceive things now. And none of us have exactly the same past life history. So we all perceive things slightly differently. How do I perceive, how do I experience loving kindness? So I do experience it as a warm and pleasant feeling and uh, in the heart area. And when it gets stronger, it's a, it's a lighter and brighter feeling, more spacious. And uh, metta can be very, very powerful. I, I remember I was sweeping leaves at what I've done when, when I was a two punsa monk and I was very grumpy. They have this, they have this, uh, in those days, you had to sweep the leaves so there wasn't a single leaf left. And it's a forest, right? And uh, there's certain parts that you had to sw- and And I just used to get so frustrated because I used to think, why can't, if you just leave a few leaves, it takes so much less time. And the end result is the same. Because by the time you finish sweeping it, there's a few more leaves. And I was just, but I was, mm. I get very attached to my opinion, and so I was like, <laughs> and <laughs> I know a better way to do it. And I suddenly felt, uh, well, the anger was gone, and there was a light and bright and pleasant feeling in my whole body, and an involuntary smile on my face. And then I saw Lumpur Nun walking past. Uh-huh. So I, I asked him the next day, Tana Jankab, when I was sweeping yesterday, did you do something? He said, yeah, I saw that you were really hot. Your mind was really hot, so I, he used his hand, so I did this. <laughs> so I knocked your mind state out of your mind. So you could see it is actually possible to sweep leaves without being angry. I'm like, could you do that every day? <laughs> and he said, no. I said, I only do it for stubborn people. <laughs> oh, cup. But, but it's a very instructive and wonderful experience because it, firstly, how can it be your mind state if someone else can knock it out of you, right? are completely identified with it, but if someone's mind is powerful enough, they can take it away. What's that? Uh. <laughs> and then, yes, it's possible to see. I mean, that, and that was, one of the, that was one of the occasions and experiences that made me commit more deeply to cultivating metta, because it's like, oh, when it's really powerful, it's really powerful. When it's really good, it's really good. So that, that helped me make a, a committed discipline to it. But an, an Aryan's metta is obviously, you know, very powerful. It's pure and powerful. They charge it up in jhana. So it's a very special, special thing. The different character types, like I was saying, different people live in different universes. Like Tanajan Jayasara are extremely gifted with languages, one of my teachers. And I was very grateful to him that he helped me have a reflective framework as a junior monk to understand why we do the things we do as monks. Because he could describe and articulate things very well, very logically, and make clear points. And uh, But he told me, suppose he came into my Dharma hall and he liked the color of the wall, 
which is kind of a creamy beige. And he says, for him to be able to remember that color, he has to he has to look at it and make a mental note, creamy beige. If he doesn't turn it into words in his mind, when he goes away, he can't remember the color. And he said he can't visualize anything. And I'm, I'm the other way I can visualize things easily. I, I think I designed and drew the design for the Chedi at Anandakiri. It took me two and a half hours. And it took four years to build. But thinking about it, designing it, that's not hard for me. And uh, Tanjaya Sarva said, I can't imagine anything. I can't visualize anything. But his... Uh, so how does he experience metta? It's probably different, right? I'm sure he does. He expresses his metta a lot. But uh, how does he? How does it feel for him? Probably different. But uh, setting the intention, making the effort, there will be metta, and it will be perceived slightly differently. Hi Ajahn, where is the Buddha? Where are all the Buddhas? Do they abide in a place beyond the thirty-two realms? It is an interesting question. It's a question the Buddha wouldn't answer. So neither will I. <laughs> I couldn't if I wanted to. But He wouldn't say whether Nibbana was in the conditions or outside of the conditions. But he did say it, he did say it wasn't bound by them. And so it's, it's the unconditioned. But he didn't say whether it was in or outside of samsara. And uh, it's one of those things, Lord Buddha did use the word imponderable. He said that the results of jhana are imponderable. Understanding the abilities of a Buddha is imponderable. And uh, you can't work it out with concepts. So I think once a person is established in Nirvana, they understand where the Buddhas are. And, uh, so, strive on. Very annoying question. Dear Ajahn, if there is no self, why does one have to liberate oneself? Who asked this question? Which annoying self answered this question? Who are? <laughs> Nobody says there's no self. It's not self. It's different. So there is a conventional being. There is conventional reality. Lord Buddha, one of his, one of his, uh, they praise him that he spoke using the conventions of the day. He, he addressed the king. Hello, great king. He addressed the potter, the farmer, the monks, monk, bhikkhu, samanera, samaneri. He could have conversations using the conventions, not a problem. But it's not the ultimate truth, it's not the deeper truth. So, even after he realized no self, he still understood the conventions and was able to navigate the conventions with mastery, impeccable in conduct and understanding, establishing an order that would last 5,000 years. You know, amazing what Lord Buddha could do having realized not self. But he understood the self-view, Sakaya Ditti, to be a view, a habitual way of perceiving the body and mind. That's not the whole picture. So one has insights into not self. In the beginning stages, the person has an insight into not self and then the feeling of a self comes back. You have another insight, there's no self, and it comes back. But you, you have glimpses of the deeper reality where there's consciousness arising and ceasing at your eyes, at your nose, at your tongue, at your ear, at your body, in the mind. And it's all in constant flux. There's no permanent abiding, non-changing thing there. So that's why it's not self. I apologize for saying you are annoying. We're all annoying in moments. I forgive you. Forgive me too. Let us take a moment.
for a short intermission and immerse ourselves in the enchanting melodies of the song, We Shall Overcome. Beautifully explore a Buddhist hymn. We shall all overcome, we shall all overcome the greed in us. We shall all overcome, we shall all overcome, we shall all overcome the hate in us. We shall conquer illusions and find true liberty that which leads us through this trouble. forevermore cause we cry and sigh no more together we'll see everlasting peace when all our fear and worry see we shall all overcome we shall all overcome we shall all overcome the greed in us We shall all overcome, we shall all overcome the hate in us. We shall conquer illusions and find true liberty that which leads us through this trouble sea. We shall go beyond the shore, be peaceful evermore, cause we cry and sigh no We shall all overcome, we shall all overcome the fear in us. We shall all overcome, we shall all overcome, we shall all overcome the doubts in us. Clear away our mind's confusion, ever watch fulfill the end. We shall dwell in peace and love, rejoicing evermore. Rejoice, we have found the Lord. By this law shall we live, through this law shall we see the joy and peace of being free. We have already given a brief introduction to Jataka stories which are recollections of some of the Buddha's previous lives when he was known as Bodhisatta. Bodhisatta means one who strives hard to serve all beings selflessness. These stories are excellent sources of motivation that can guide us in the right direction on our path to success. Please encourage both children and adults to read these stories and watch these programs. These stories will surely help guide them towards success. Now, here is the Latukika Jataka story. Latukika Chadok Chadok Wadurun Nam Noksai ในพุทธกาลสมัย
ณดินแดนชมพูทวีปครั้งเมื่อพระบรมศาสดาสัมมาสัมพุทธเจ้าตรัสรู้อนุตระสัมมาสัมโพธิญาณนั้นพระพุทธองค์ทรงเผยแผ่พระพุทธธรรมโปรดสรรพสัตว์ทั้งหลายทั่วทั้งอนุทวีปสถาปนาพระพุทธศาสนาจนรุ่งเรืองสืบมาในคราวนั้นแม้พระพุทธศาสนาจะพึ่งสถาปนาได้ไม่นานนักแต่ก็มีเหล่านักบวชชาวเมืองทุกชั้นวันนะต่างเลื่อมใสศรัทธาถวายตัวเป็นพุทธสาวกบวชเป็นพระภิกษุมากมายแต่ทว่ากลับมีภิกษุรูปหนึ่งแม้เข้ามาบวชใต้ร่มธงธรรมแห่งองค์พระศาสดาแต่ยังมิวายอาฆาตมาดร้ายกระทำตัวเป็นปัจจามิตรต่อองค์พระศาสดาทั้งยังมีจิตใจโหดร้ายไม่มีความกรุณาปราณีต่อเหล่าสัตว์เล็กสัตว์น้อยภิกษุผู้นี้มีนามโจทขานว่าพระเทวทัตนั่นเองพฤติกรรมของพระเทวทัตนี้เหล่าภิกษุด้วยกันเองต่างรู้แจ้งดีเช็กเช่นเดียวกับพระพุทธองค์ที่ทรงปรารบถึงพระเทวทัตให้เหล่าภิกษุได้ฟังกันในโรงธรรมสภาดูก่อนภิกษุทั้งหลายบัดนี้ท่านมาประชุมกันด้วยเรื่องอันใดข้าแต่องค์พระศาสดาพวกข้าพระองค์กำลังสนทนาถึงพระเทวทัตผู้มีจิตใจโหดร้ายไม่มีความปราณีต่อสัพพสัตว์ทั้งที่ตนถือครองเพศสมณะแท้ๆแต่หาได้ละอายต่อบาปที่ทำไม่ใช่แล้วพระเทวทัตผู้นี้แม้กับพระศาสดายังคิดร้ายช่างเป็นการไม่บังควรเอาซะเลยขอรับอืมดูก่อนภิกษุทั้งหลายเรากับพระเทวทัตนี้ผูกเวรกันมาตั้งแต่อดีตชาติแม้ในการก่อนเขาก็มีพื้นฐานจิตใจโหดร้ายไม่มีความเมตตาปราณีผูกใจอาฆาตมาดร้ายมาจนถึงชาตินี้เดี๋ยวเราจะเล่าให้พวกเธอทั้งหลายฟังจะได้เข้าใจและนำโอวาทแห่งเรานี้ไปน้อมนำจิตใจต่อไปแล้วพระพุทธองค์ก็ทรงระลึกชาติด้วยบุพเพนิวาสานุสติญาณนำละตุกิกกาชาดกมาสาธกดังนี้ย้อนไปในอดีตการนานมาณป่าหิมมพานอันกว้างใหญ่ในการนั้นพระโพธิสัตว์เสวยพระชาติเป็นพญาช้างพลายสูงใหญ่งามสง่าดูน่าเกรงขามยิ่งนักโพธิสัตว์พญาช้างเป็นจ่าโครงนำช้างบริวารถึง8 0,000 ื่นตัวหากินในป่านี้อย่างสงบสุขวันนี้ท่านพญาช้างจะพาพวกเราไปหากินที่ไหนนะเจ้านี่ห่วงแต่กินดูสิอ้วนจนเดินตามท่านพญาช้างไม่ทันแล้วเดี๋ยวก็หลงทางกันพอดีเอ้าพี่รีบเดินสิในป่าเนี่ยพืชพันธุ์ทัญญาหารอุดมสมบูรณ์อ้าวอ้าวเดินระวังระวังนะไม่ต้องรีบขนาดนั้นก็ได้เดี๋ยวจะไปเหยียบสัตว์เล็กสัตว์น้อยเข้าแม่ภูมิใจจริงๆจากโขลงเราแข็งแกร่งบึกบึนสมเป็นชาติช้างจริงๆจากโขลงดีมีชัยไปกว่าครึ่งไปไหนใครก็กลัวเพราะช้างตัวใหญ่อีกด้านหนึ่งยังมีนางนกไส้ตัวหนึ่งทำรังบนพื้นดินกำลังกบฟองไข่ที่กำลังจะฟักออกมาเป็นตัวลาลาลาลาลาอีกไม่นานลูกน้อยของเราก็จะออกจากไข่แล้วเราจะได้เห็นหน้าลูกน้อยน่ารักของเราแล้วดีใจจังเลยแม่จะประคบประงมเจ้าเลี้ยงดีมดไม่ให้ไต่ไรไม่ให้ตอมเลยนะจ๊ะลูกจ๋าออกมาไวๆนะจ๊ะลูกไม่นานช้าไข่ก็ค่อยๆปริแตกลูกนกไส้ก็โผล่หัวรับชีวิตใหม่ทันทีที่ฟักออกลูกนกไส้ต่างก็ส่งเสียงร้องทันทีนางนกไส้ประคบประงมเลี้ยงลูกอย่างดีฟ
่ายลูกนกนั้นแม้จะมีขนขึ้นแล้วแต่ปีกยังไม่แข็งพอที่จะพยุงตัวบินได้ยังต้องพึ่งแม่ของตนต่อไปแต่แล้ววันหนึ่งเสียงสะเทือนเลื่อนลั่นก็ดังขึ้นสร้างความตื่นตระหนกให้กับลูกนกเป็นอย่างมากแม่จ๋าทำไมพื้นดินสสสสสสันอย่างนี้ล่ะจ๊ะจริงด้วยแม่หนูว่าจะลมแล้วจ้ะแม่จ๋าหนูกลัวเสียงอะไรอย่างนี้ไม่ต้องกลัวนะจ๊ะลูกจ๋าแม่อยู่ตรงนี้แล้วมามะมารวมกลุ่มกันนะจ๊ะลูกเดี๋ยวแม่จะบินไปดูนาว่าเกิดอะไรขึ้นนางนกไส้บินไปสังเกตการเมื่อเห็นที่มาของเสียงนั้นก็ตกใจเพราะรังของนางอยู่บนเส้นทางของช้างโขลงใหญ่พอดีฮ่าโขลงช้างนี่นาทำไงดีล่ะเนี่ยอีกนิดเดียวโขงช้างก็จะเดินมาถึงทางของเราต้องเหยียบลูกโรงแบนแต่แต่แน่ๆลูกเราตัวยังเล็กบินไม่ได้เลยทอลูกแม่ไม่ได้เราจะยอมให้ลูกๆตายไม่ได้เราต้องไปอ้อนวอนขอพญาช้างไม่ให้ของช้างเหยียบลูกๆของเรานางนกไส้ไม่รอช้าประคองฝีกทั้งสองข้างเข้าด้วยกันแล้วบินไปหยุดอยู่หน้าจากของช้างพลางพูดด้วยน้ำเสียงอ้อนวอนขอร้องว่าหยุดก่อนท่านพญาช้างมีเหตุอันใดหรือนางนกไส้ฉันไหนเจ้าถึงมาขวางทางเราข้าขอไว้ท่านพญาช้างผู้มีพละกำลังมหาศาลผู้เป็นจากของช้างนี้ข้าขอไว้ท่านด้วยปีกอันน้อยนิดของข้าขอให้ท่านโปรดเว้นทางที่จะผ่านไปนี้เพื่อขอให้ท่านสงสารลูกน,น้อยของข้าที่อยู่ในทางนั้นด้วยเถิดลูกน้อยในรังเจ้าอยู่ในทางที่โขงช้างของข้าจะผ่านนั้นหรือใช่แล้วจ้ะลูกน้อยของข้ายังเล็กนักยังไม่สามารถสยายปีกบินได้ท่านพญาช้างโปรดเมตตาด้วยเถิดดูก่อนแม่นางนกไส้เอ๋ยเจ้าอย่าได้ร้องไห้ค่ำครวญไปเลยเราจะช่วยเจ้ารักษาลูกน้อยของเจ้าเองโขงช้างเนี่ยจะไม่เป็นอันตรายแก่ลูกเจ้าเลยแม้แต่น้อยไม่ต้องห่วงขอบพระคุณท่านพญาช้างมากข้ากับลูกจะไม่ลืมพระคุณนี้เลยพญาช้างเมื่อรับปากกับนางนกไส้แล้วก็เดินเข้าไปยืนคล่อมรังของนางนกไส้จนโขงช้างทั้ง8 0,000 ื่นเชือกเดินผ่านไปลูกนกทั้งหลายจึงปลอดภัยไม่โดนเหยียบฮะท่านพญาช้างตัวโตจังเลยอย่างนี้เราก็ไม่ต้องโดนเหยียบแล้วเชียพวกเจ้าไม่ต้องกลัวนะเดี๋ยวเดียวพวกเจ้าก็จะปลอดภัยจะได้อยู่กับแม่เจ้าแล้วละขอบคุณท่านพญาช้างมากขอรับโตขึ้นฉันจะเอาอย่างท่านพญาช้างเจ้าเป็นลูกนกนะโตขึ้นจะไปเป็นช้างได้ไงโตขึ้นก็ต้องเป็นนกซี่ถึงจะถูกเสียงลูกนกกู่ร้องด้วยความดีใจนางนกไส้บินเข้าไปกอดลูกอย่างมีความสุขขอบพระคุณท่านพญาช้างมากเอาลูกลูกรีบขอบคุณท่านพญาช้างเร็วท่านช่วยชีวิตพวกเราเอาไว้ขอบพระคุณครับท่านพญาช้างเราตั้งหากที่ต้องขอโทษเจ้าที่โขงช้างของเราเป็นภัยแก่เจ้าและลูกลูกถึงอย่างไรท่านพญาช้างก็มีเมตตาข้ากับลูกจะไม่ลืมเลยอืมก่อนที่ข้าจะไปอยากให้เจ้าระวังลูกลูกเจ้าให้ดีเพราะใช่แต่โขงช้างของเราเท่านั้นที่ผ่านมาทางนี้แต่ยังมีช้างอีกเชือกหนึ่งเที่ยวออกหากินเพียงลําพังช้างเชือกเนี่ยเป็นช้างเกเรไม่ฟังคำผู้ใดเมื่อเขามาถึงเจ้าจงอ้อนวอนเขาให้เมตตาต่อเจ้าและลูกนะข้าไปแล้วละขอบคุณท่านพญาจากโครงมากแล้วฉันจะพูดขอร้องช้างเชือกนั้นเองจริงอย่างที่พญาช้างว่าเพียงไม่นานนักก็มีช้างอีกเชือกเดินเที่ยวหากินตามป่าเชิงเขาผ่านมาตามทางเพียงเชือกเดียวแม่นางนกไส้ก็ได้กระทำการต้อนรับช้างเชือกนั้นโดยเอาปีกทั้งสองข้างอัญชลีเหมือนดังที่กระทำกับพญาช้างจากโขงที่ผ่านมาช้าก่อนท่านช้างพายน้อยนะนางนกไส้น้อยกล้าดียังไงมาขวางทางช้างอย่างข้าไม่กลัวตายหรือไงฮะข้าแต่ท่านช้างพายผู้มีพละกำลังเป็นเลิศตัวข้านี้เป็นเพียงนกไส้เพียงน้อยนิดมิหารกล้าจะขวางทางท่านหรอกงั้นก็ดีแล้วรีบๆหลบไปอย่ามาขวางทางข้าให้เสียเวลาเดี๋ยวก็เหยียบซะหลอก
นี่ฟังข้าก่อนท่านช้างพายข้าขอไว้ท่านช้างผู้มีกำลังมากด้วยปีกทั้งสองของข้าลูกของข้าอยู่ในทางนี้ขอท่านเมตตาอย่าได้ข้าลูกน้อยของข้าพระเจ้าซึ่งยังเล็กบินไปไหนไม่ได้ด้วยเถิดบังอาจมาสั่งข้างั้นเหรออย่ามาอ้อนวอนเสียให้ยากเลยข้าจะฆ่าลูกของเจ้าเสียบัดนี้ละท่านอย่าทำอะไรลูกของข้าเลยนะพวกเขายังบินไม่ได้ด้วยซ้ำข้าขอร้องแล้วนะท่านนะอย่าทำอะไรลูกของข้าเลยนางนกไส้ตัวน้อยๆเอ๋ยตัวเจ้าก็แค่นี้จะมีปัญญามาทำอะไรข้าซึ่งเป็นช้างตัวใหญ่ได้ทีเนี้ยเราจะขยี้ลูกของเจ้าทีละตัวทีละตัวด้วยเท้าซ้ายของเรานี่แหละนี่นี่นี่มีให้แหลกไปเลยเจ้าช้างเกเรใจยามช้าเดินตรงเข้าใช้เท้าบดขยี้ลูกน้อยของนางนกไส้ตายทีละตัวอย่างโหดเที่ยวไร้ความปราณียิ่งเห็นเลือดของลูกนกตัวน้อยมันก็ยิ่งส่งเสียงร้องด้วยความสะใจแล้วก็จากไปอย่างรวดเร็วตายซะเถอะเจ้านกไส้ตัวน้อยอยู่ไปก็เกะกะขวางทางข้าช่วยด้วยช่วยด้วยช่วยด้วยแม่จ๋าช่วยลูกด้วยอย่าทำอะไรพวกเราเลยนะท่านช้างพวกเรากลัวแล้วอย่าอย่าอย่านี่นี่วิ่งเข้าไปวิ่งเข้าไปมันจริงอยากเรียนเรื่องของพระพุทธศาสนาเรื่องของพระพุทธศาสนาเรื่องของพระพุทธศาสนาเรื่องของพระพุทธศาสนาเรื่องของพระพุทธศาสนาเรื่องของพระ